we're going to talk about global investment, economic security, uh, and, in, and industrial based policy. Uh, our guest is Nicoletta Giordani from the Pentagon. Um, and those of you that were in our breakout session, we're going to try to have as little overlap as possible, but we do have to establish a little, just a, a baseline of understanding about what the defense industrial base is. So we are going to talk a little bit about that to set the stage for what the defense industrial base is, and then we're going to go into um, some of the ways that D the Department of Defense is looking to continuously modernize the way that they look at that and, and, and uh, talk a little bit about how they acquire innovation and then some how you, how you secure the innovation in the defense industrial base. Uh, we're going to probably do that for about 20 minutes and leave five or 10 minutes for questions at the end. So please think of uh, questions that you'd like. Um, Nicoletta, thank you for being here, coming out from Washington. Can you please just explain a little bit about what your role is at the Department of Defense? And then um, and from there, let's just get an established baseline on uh, when you say defense industrial base, what that pertains to. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me here today. I'm really excited to talk about foreign investments, uh, economic security, and industrial base policy um, to strengthen the 21st century uh, defense industrial base. We definitely need to focus on collaboration among U.S. government, um, you know, private industry, and uh, uh, allies and partners uh, in the international arena. Uh, in terms of kind of my um, my role uh, at the Pentagon. Um, in my career, I didn't start off at the Pentagon. I started off in industry. So I was uh, in banking and management consulting for over a decade doing merger and acquisitions like corporate restructuring in, in a variety of different uh, sectors and industries. So a very exciting time. Uh, but um, after that experience, uh, I landed a role at the Department of Defense in uh, um, working closely with industry, uh, mostly on protecting uh, uh, their technologies and ensuring their you know, corporate restructuring or merger and acquisitions uh, uh, didn't uh, uh, raise any concerns from a national security perspective. So long story, like you know, jumping ahead of my current role right now, I'm the director of Global Investment and Economic Security. Uh, what we really do there is to, uh, you know, from a you said protection perspective, uh, uh, we oversee authorities. Uh, you may be familiar with the Committee of Foreign Investments in the United States, uh, uh, where you know we review investments, uh, um, including uh, real estate investments, uh, to ensure the protection of the national security of the United States. Uh, we're also in the Teen Telecom Committee. Uh, the Teen Telecom Committee is again an interagency committee where we review foreign requests for uh, uh, licenses in our telecommunication services uh, under sea cables uh, uh, and related uh, components uh, uh, to ensure that uh, there are no concerns uh, or unresolved concerns from a national security perspective. I also have a role in overseeing domestic merger and acquisitions, uh, particularly with a focus on antitrust and anti-competitiveness concerns, uh, you know, and how that may impact you know, the vitality of the industrial base, innovation, you know, as you have, uh, you know, a lot of consolidation, there is a risk that, you know, there's less competition and less innovation in a particular sector that may be critical to the Department of Defense or the national security of the United States. Uh, there are also other authorities that are emerging, and I wanted to just uh, touch on that uh, very quickly because they may impact, uh, you know, um, some of the um, companies here or investors going forward. Uh, a new authority that's being implemented right now is called ICTS. It's an acronym. I use it because it's more known, the acronym is more known than the actual full name. But it stands for Information and Communications Technology and Services. That's an interagency committee uh, chaired by the Department of Commerce uh, where they're looking at foreign entities or foreign owned entities in the United States that provide services uh, in the telecommunications uh, information uh, um, arena, uh, including, for example, cyber you know, support or cloud component support. Uh, and they are reviewed to ensure that there are no uh, national security concerns with these foreign entities operating and supporting businesses in the United States. Uh, and they also have a, a component of looking at foreign investments uh, in critical infrastructure. 
And then the last one is outbound investment, uh, which may interest especially investors who uh, you know, invest overseas in areas that are critical to the United States, like uh, um, artificial intelligence quantum information systems and semiconductors and microelectronics. Uh, and the intent of this new regulation, which is in the process of being developed, uh, is really to ensure that uh, our capital doesn't uh, you know, enhance uh, both e economically and militarily uh, you know, our adversaries. So these are the majority of the portfolios I oversee. Um, from a Department of Defense perspective, of course, we look mostly at equities related to the Department of Defense and the defense industrial base. So the defense industrial base, it's fair to say, is probably the largest uh, industrial base that you can possibly think of. Uh, you know, we have uh, among our industrial base the largest corporations in the world. You're very familiar with them. They produce uh, major weapon systems, right, from missiles to satellites to... Uh, you know, planes, um, tanks, but we also have, you know, a very broad industrial base that seems to be probably um, not directly related to um, uh, the Department of Defense business, but from food to medical supplies to pharmaceuticals to um, uh, artificial intelligence, software development, uh, cyber, um, uh, you know, quantum, uh, biotech, batteries, uh, laptops, uh, you name it. Like, so, uh, you know, as we think about a number, we usually go and say it's about 100,000 companies or more, but it's definitely more than just 100,000, and it spans across the entire United States and abroad. So the defense industrial base, um, as, as, as you said, is probably, I, I can't think of any other industrial base on Earth that is far and wide. And this is an industrial base that has some platforms that last literally decades. We have B-52s that are a lot older than the people flying them. I mean, this is a technology that came out in the 50s. And, um, but, you know, you have these platforms that last for decades, but you also have the, the need to keep the warfighter in the latest and greatest. So how do you do that balance? How do you... Um, like, where, where do you see, the, with technology, the way it's advancing now, if you want to be cutting edge, that means you can't just rely on a decade-long program. So what are you doing, or what do you see the defense industrial base doing over the next, you know, one, three, five years to keep up with that pace of uh, innovation? Uh, thank you, and uh, that's right. There's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of like, uh, balancing of different uh, needs now. We have to kind of always look at current demands, right? because we do have uh, situations around the world that we, you know, we are involved with. And at the same time, we need to plan or anticipate future threats and contingencies that may you know, uh, happen. And so um, I think we are in a kind of decisive decade from, a, for, from an industrial base perspective, defense industrial base perspective. We are seeing major shifts. Um, we have a geopolitical shift with uh, peer, near-peer uh, competitors, uh, they are challenging the world order. Uh, from an economic standpoint, you, you know, uh, what we can say is that DOD has always been fighting, um, you know, uh, conflicts uh, in a traditional sense, if you will, you know, through five domains, uh, land, sea, air, uh, you know, uh, space and uh, information cyber, right? Uh, but now uh, the department has been called to shift and look at economic statecraft. Uh, and uh, economic uh, warfare uh, more closely, given that our adversaries are engaging in, in those type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, in that type of approach, right? Um, including, in, you know, economic coercion, uh, not just towards the United States, but to smaller countries in particular. And then you have the technology aspect, um, which is the third shift, right? And, and that's where continually, continuously evolving technology continues to evolve business models and you have one of the largest, if not the largest institution in the world, having to adapt quickly at a speed at those changing models. So, you know, how do we do this? So, uh, first of all, the department has like kind of underscored the importance that the industrial base has for, uh, you know, the um, national security of the United States by uh, appointing for the first time an assistant secretary for industrial base policy, Senate confirmed assistant secretary. 
and um, the Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, and the Under Secretary for Acquisition and Sustainment have directed the Assistant Secretary for Industrial Base Policy to develop the first uh, National Defense Industrial Strategy for the United States. Um, and, and you know, with that, uh, we're basically going to use this strategy, which will be published um, in less than a month. Um, and, and we'll use that strategy to direct what type of engagements we are going to have with industry, how do we're going to do policy development, what type of investments we are going to do from a Department of Defense perspective. And, and the strategy is going to um, cover like a four you know, pillars. Uh, one, we'll look at the uh, resilience of the supply chain. How do we continue to have a supply chain that is uh, you know, uh, uh, resilient to impact from adversarial capital, economic coercion, or supply chain disruptions. And, and so, you know, we're going to work closely with Congress uh, to ensure that we have uh, funding and, uh, and uh, policies that can support domestic production. Uh, we're going to look at, you know, um, accelerator programs uh, like the Defense Innovation Unit that, uh, you know, based here in, uh, in California, at least headquartered, but in, with other areas within the United States, that supports the adoption, um, the accelerated adoption of technologies that are important to the Department of Defense, working very closely with industry in a more expedited acquisition process. Uh, we're looking at how do we stockpile our inventory for critical technologies so that, you know, I think the war in Ukraine and now the events that are happening in Israel have shown how critical it is to be able to have a healthy stockpile, healthy inventory, so that you, know, you don't then start putting pressure on industry to accelerate or surge very quickly uh, you know, um, in times of uh, a conflict, uh, which make it, makes it very difficult for industry and the government to be able to manage that uh, inventory. We're also going to look at you know, workforce readiness uh, you know, in a lot of different areas. Uh, they are important to our economy or the economic security. We have a lack of talent. Uh, it's you know you see it in the manufacturing, uh, advanced manufacturing, particularly industries. You see it in cyber, right? Um, especially within government, uh, for obvious reasons. How do we also approach hiring in different ways? Meaning like a broadening, you know, the uh, the arbitrage there but also how do we uh, continue to invest in apprenticeship programs uh, uh, where you know, we you know, partner industry with the federal labs or schools so that we can start bringing in and training more people in areas where we see a gap. Um, acquisition flexibility is another important aspect that maybe I want to and, and if you can, when you, when you talk about that, like, let's localize it. There's a lot of uh, startups here, there's folks that have technologies that are really uh, you know, at the forefront. So if, if our friends who are sitting out here are, are in that category, maybe you know, talk a little bit about you know, the priorities and strategic opportunities for you know, this size company and how they do get engaged. Because you mentioned the Defense, Defense Innovation Unit. And I know the Pentagon's doing some amazing things with the small business, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, really trying to harness that innovation belt that's within our small businesses. Um, so if, if you can maybe uh, uh, try to enlighten us on what somebody out here could do to learn, um, you know, do they come approach you? Is there a, a, a process to learn more? You know, so. Sure, no, I'm happy to do that. We have several programs uh, that are, could be of interest uh, and I'm, um, I'd like the opportunity to actually share them. So I don't know if everyone uh, was familiar or is familiar with the Defense Innovation Unit. Uh, but it's really, you know, um, uh, 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 an entity that was developed to accelerate the, the, the adoption of commercial uh, and dual-use technologies. Uh, the idea is to bring them in uh, and be able to do that at speed and scale. So, you know, if, if you're not familiar with that, I encourage everyone to look up their website. They post solicitations on their website. They're public, uh, right? Uh, they, they look, uh, you know, more often than not to very critical, innovative, cutting-edge technology. So I think, you know, the audience here clearly, you know, meets that criteria of what I've seen over the last couple of days. And, and of course, there's kind of, a, you know, each solicitation shows the criteria for, uh, you know, um, eligibility 
to that particular program, but that's a way to take in uh, uh, you know, proposals and connect industry with uh, you know, federal funded uh, labs or uh, government uh, resources to be able to then commercialize that, uh, that technology. On the small business side, I think that's a very important one that you brought up, Mark. Uh, you know, we have a number of programs, uh, uh, the Small Business uh, Innovation Research uh, you know, Program and the um, Small Business Technology Transfer Program. There's where, you know, again, um, uh, those are competitive programs, uh, but, uh, and, and they're US government, they're you know, um, um, wide, uh, but DOD, the Department of Defense, has been the largest contributor. I think last year we contributed about a billion dollars to that program, and that's a way for small businesses to be able to receive funds for research uh, and development with the idea of uh, being able to then uh, uh, help them uh, through the process of commercializing uh, those te technologies or those prototypes. Uh, there's a new program that you know just came online. Um, it's called Office of Strategic Capital. Uh, the intent of the Office of Strategic Capital um, is to help uh, early stages uh, companies on technologies that are critical to the Department of Defense. Uh, but you know, again, it, it spans, like I said, don't think just about weapons programs, right? We're talking about a wide variety of um, industries and sectors here that we can uh, uh, you know, um, leverage uh, uh, for what we need to do. And in that case, the Office of Strategic Capital has partnered with the Small Business Administration. They have a program that basically uh, invites investors in uh, you know, and basically um, marries uh, investors' funds with uh, uh, funds, loan guarantees coming from the government and, and that uh, is to uh, be able to foster investments uh, in areas that are critical to the Department of Defense. Um, then kind of a little more mature, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it's you know, the Defense Production Act. Um, some of you may be familiar with that. It's been around since 1950 or maybe before then. You, you probably heard about it during COVID when it was invoked to yeah. produce some, uh, what is it, PP, the personal protective? Mm -hmm gear and ventilators and so forth. It's where the government can uh, compel, I think, right? Compel Yeah, so you, the, the, the Defense Production Act has various purposes. In that case, I like compel industry to uh, do direct industry in, a, in, a, in you know, doing certain things in case of emergencies. The one I'm talking about is more about um, you know, closing capacity gaps. So the, the, you know, the Defense Production Act has the ability you know, through presidential determination to invest uh, directly for purchase, purchase agreements, loan, loan guarantees into particular in companies, right? There's always like a match there. The company has to uh, put in their own, the company or the industry that we are investing in has to match some of that funding. But there are different, dif different criteria based on the emergency or based on the gap that needs to be closed. But you know, a lot of companies have successfully you know, obtained uh, Defense Production Act uh, you know, funding over the last you know, um, uh, e few years, particularly over the last couple of years, uh, because of our budget on DPA has been uh, um, greatly enhanced. Uh, you know, our ability to do those investments has greatly you know, increased. So I do want to get to questions in, in a couple of minutes. But before I do that, I want to and, and I know we only have time to gloss over it, but uh, we talked about how businesses can look to do work with the Pentagon, but can you speak a little bit to the security? Like, there's some steps or adversarial capital that you want to stay away from. Can you just speak to some things that might trip up a company if it did want to work within the defense industrial base so, they, so that the people out here do are thinking about that when they're looking at their next round of investment uh, you know, where that's going to come from and, and, and what their concerns ought to be if they want to work in this space. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's a very important, critical uh, topic. Um, I mean, whether a company wants to work with the Department of Defense, uh, but also, uh, you know, regardless of whether or not they directly work with the Department of Defense, there are also other authorities uh, within the United States uh, um, government that authorize the government to review uh, transactions or merger and acquisitions or, or investments uh, uh, 
to ensure the you know, economic prosperity of the United States, but also to protect our national security. So, so you may not have contracts with the, you know, with the Department of Defense, but you may still go through a review uh, because of the nature of the investment uh, and uh, the nature of the investor that's uh, you know, investing uh, funds in your company. So you know, I, I, I think um, I can share how we think about this risk, uh, but I think you know, it's mutually beneficial if you know, uh, both things along the same lines, because uh, uh, you know, I think it's very well illustrated by the recent issuance of the CFUS uh, EO, where the president has directed um, you know, the um, CFUS committee to look at you know, um, investments uh, in the aggregate and also look at third parties uh, uh, related to you know, the investors that make, that's making the investment. So for example, you know, when, you're, uh, having, uh, when an investor comes in and you're taking money, so of course so there are countries out there that we have concerns with. And, but you know, sometimes it's not very apparent. Uh, you know, those countries are very good on obfuscating you know, uh, who they are, uh, well, who, who's the ultimate, you know, beneficial owner of that particular, you know, company that's investing in your company. Sometimes you have, uh, uh, you know, private equity or venture capital firms. They have general partners and limited partners. Limited partners may appear to be completely passive, but, you know, the reality may be that there are other agreements in place that go beyond just the ownership of having a seat on the board, or having the rights to you know, access. Sometimes there are like collaboration agreements in place, intellectual property agreements in place. So mm -hmm. you have to join develop, you know, do a joint development um, on a particular product or technology that will give them access anyway, uh, regardless of uh, you know, where the investment is coming from and whether or not they're limited partners. So we do look at all those you know, areas, right? So uh, that's part of our due diligence. Uh, I also want to share that we're not just worried about the technology or the product per se, but we also look at the intellectual property. We look at the know-how, so the talent that you have. So who are your engineers? engineers? So what do they know? You know? Are they potential targets? So there's a much broader um, view of the rest that you, may, you know, uh, that you may not be thinking about, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so those are some of the areas where I will say we, we focus, you know, the majority and, of our time. And, and just to add to that, uh, I don't know how many people watch 60 Minutes here, but mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago, uh, the FBI director and his counterparts at the Five Eyes, which is you know, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, Canada, and the United States, the intelligence chiefs all sat down with 60 Minutes and talked about um, you know, what the most significant threat was. And it was, in part, China going after the technologies that um, this nation uh, are working hard to innovate. Uh, he said that the FBI director said that Silicon Valley was the number one target of, uh, of the PR, uh, PRC's efforts to acquire uh, disruptive technologies, next generation. Um, and they do it through a variety of ways, through shell companies, through, uh, through theft, through employee, you know, planting people there. So it's really something that if you're not up to speed on, I would encourage you to be, because if you have a disruptive technology or if you even, if somebody thinks you do, then you are a target. Um, I would like to open it for questions. If you do have a question, please go to the microphones here and um, you know, we'll try to answer anything you have. In the event you have a question that you don't want to say in front of your competitors, just come up to us afterwards. All right. The gentleman uh, that looks like he had a rough night. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, this is a, you know, a vintage but very comfortable fire-themed sweater. Um, Nicoletta, this was fantastic. Thank you. Um, I feel like this might be a little bit basic, but for a tech-focused audience, it might be interesting to hear some of the focus areas that DOD is interested in and that some of the programs you mentioned are interested in and so that people kind of have a sense of, of what's being looked for and, you know, do I qualify? Right, and we have five minutes, so... Um why don't you give us a one to two minute answer? Yeah, no, I'll be quick on this one because I did mention um, a few programs. So please, you know, uh, reach out to me uh, at the end of this, uh, 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 this segment so that I can point you to the right website or where you can see all the criteria. Are you here all day? Yeah, I'm here right? all day. Yeah. Okay, so 
because each program has different criteria for eligibility, so it would take you know, forever for me to do it right now, so, but I'm happy to point you to, in the right direction. And then I think in terms of the areas of technologies that we are looking at, so um, specific areas that, on innovation that we are looking at is AI, um, uh, cyber, uh, quantum, biotech, uh, you know, but also we're looking for innovations in batteries, right? That is, that is uh, an area that's critical uh, to us in, mm -hmm. because batteries go into a lot of our weapon systems. Uh, uh, we're looking for, uh, you know, uh, revitalizing our critical mineral, um, you know, uh, industry. Uh, we're also uh, looking into kind of casting and forging, which is less, uh, uh, you know, if you will, innovative, but there is a, a way to do advanced manufacturing in those areas. Uh, so that's where we look for the innovation. Uh, we have a list of 14 technologies that are listed in our, on our website. You don't have to word, you know, list them all today. Just no, tell them where I'm they saying. can find it. Yeah. So under um, Department of Defense Research and Engineering, like you see the, the 14 list of technologies that we consider critical uh, to the Department of Defense. And I imagine, I mean, the Department of Defense provides healthcare services to hundreds of thousands of, of soldiers, uh, air, you know, members of the military and their families. So I imagine healthcare, um, you know, uh, is probably part of that as well. Why don't we go with another question? Why don't we alternate here? You're, you're next. Uh, so Ty Carlson, uh, CTO Pattern Computer. Mm -hmm. you, uh, one, we work both in AI and we're working with batteries, so perhaps we should talk. We have some really interesting work we're doing. The question, you bring up an interesting question when you talk about the employees that a company has with regard to uh, threats to the DOD. Yet we're also responsible for equal opportunity hiring. So how do you advise a company that um, wants to be able to comply with the government rules regarding diversity and equal opportunity hiring in the context of working, potentially working on a DOD project where a foreign national uh, as part of the employment may actually threaten that uh, opportunity? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so we have ways uh, in which, uh, uh, you know, that can be done. So there are, uh, you know, there are laws and regulations that uh, allow, you know, certain countries to put some requirements. Uh, so if we're talking about working, let's say that's the most obvious one, doing classified work, that requires to have US citizenship and that requires to have a security clearance. Uh, and that work requires to be done in certain areas, right? So, uh, you know, um, as long as you meet the uh, requirements uh, of that particular contract, uh, then, you know, then, then you have the talent that aligns with that, right? So we, we do that on a regular basis. So, um that's a question that I got a lot when I, when I was at the Department of Justice in the National Security Division. It's a longer answer um, than we have time to give right now, but I will get with you afterwards uh, because there are very real concerns. Like through, the, if you're not aware of what the talent program is, or if you're, uh, you know, sometimes you just can't conduct a background check. To, based on you know, where somebody grew up. So that is a concern. There are some strategies, and I think it's really difficult for businesses because on one hand, you're trying to protect your, your, inter your workforce. On the other hand, you could get sued by DOJ for, um, you know, because I could come visit you from the National Security Division and warn you, and then the Civil Rights Division will come hammer you for uh, you know, it's one thing to, when you have a thousand employees, but when you have twenty or twenty-five employees, yeah. Uh, so let's, that's a uh, different question. I'm Thank happy you. to get with you after and give you a, a more robust answer on that, and anybody else that would as well. Thank uh, you. Let's go. We have about thirty seconds, but we'll do our best. Hi, Cynthia Figgy, CEO of CSR Hub. Thank you very much for coming and speaking with us. Um, regarding your point around supply chain resilience, there's a lot of uh, mounting pressure from the EU and, and this country as well on disclosures, particularly around carbon footprint mm -hmm. and climate change. Um, what work uh, is the Department of Defense doing to support um, climate, cl the impact on business of climate change. And you have uh, one second. <laughs> no, uh, just... We are actively involved uh, in the, in the um, department, especially, you know, uh, the impact that that has on, uh, the climate change has on installations uh, in our bases overseas. So that's all I can say. In... 
Minus so, two seconds. Yeah, we can, yeah. Uh, again, we're here, we're, we're both here for the rest of the day. If you have any more questions, you know, please come up to us. Uh, John Carlin, who was here uh, uh, for the last two days, did leave, but I can um, either try to answer any of your questions on that side, you know, the compliance or legal side, and I can also put you in touch with them, and we can share the information, uh, Nicola's contact info as well. All right, thank you very much.